Yeah, so I guess today is our last meeting, right? <laughs> uh, I hope that this was fun. Uh, let's see. Uh, so I thought that uh, it made sort of sense to re recapitulate a little bit of what we had discussed and put things into context and try to uh, say a little bit more about the Poincaré conjecture, maybe even remind you what it was about. Uh, so like if you go to the beginning, like 11 weeks ago, because we had to suspend one of the weeks, if you remember. Uh, really, like the question we were interested in, right, was like, what are the possible shapes of the universe, right? So, now, again, like this question uh, can be, quite tricky. And so that's why it's useful to start uh, with this easier problem, which is uh, that of like a one dimensional universe, right? And th that's where we started uh, our discussion. And if you remember uh, more or less like what happened with one dimensional universes, right? Is like, well, they could maybe like if they were infinite, they could look like a, like like the real line basically. If they were finite, they could look like maybe like a finite interval, right? I should put like dot 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 here. Or uh, they could also look like the circle, right? Now, um, how can we relate to this discussion to wha what we were talking about last time? So why are they, and let, let's focus on the circle. So the circle had this property, right? That if um, you travel along the circle, right? You're doing your Sunday trip on a on a circular universe right and like again when you walk on a circle if you think about the experience of walking on a circle if the circle is sufficiently large it really will won't feel that different from walking on a segment right like uh but somehow after like on a circle, like you do eventually reach this moment where like you realize you are at the same spot where you started, right? Uh, it's the surprise of our character when uh, they, they are back at where they began. So like in general, th this uh, curves, right? Uh, think of the circle as a curve. These curves were like, where if you walk along this curve, you return to where you started. They're just called closed curves. So closed curves, uh, are, they look like this, for example. So here are like some closed curves. Okay. Uh, so closed curves just means that uh, you return to the original, to the starting point if you wait, if you just walk, if you walk for a sufficiently long amount of time. Is that making sense? Now, uh, 
I, I guess at the beginning it was not that obvious when we were talking about these one dimensional universes. Uh, why I said that the really like the two model cases, right? Like these are like the exemplary cases, right? So these, these are like the quintessential examples, the, the model the cases. If you were trying to do a taxonomy of these one dimensional universes, which are finite in size, more or less, you, you would say that these are the only two possibilities uh, the reason being that, like, for example, if you take, like, just to take the case of closed curve, which is more interesting to what we're doing, if you look at closed curves, you can sort of do what we di discussed last time. So let me share that screen with you in case you wanted a reminder, which is kind of fun. If, I don't know if anyone played with that after, after I showed it to you, but it's like a fun way to spend your time uh, over cat videos which are also fun, but uh, everyone remembers this. Like if you hear, uh, let's see. If you start, like, let's wait for this animation to end. Everyone can see it, right? Yes, good, good. If you, if you write, draw your favorite close curve, right? I'm trying to draw it as some sort of animal. It looks like an elephant, right? Kind of. <laughs> Boom, the elephant went away by out of magic. So what happened, right, is that if you have a closed curve, you could study this flow, like don't, like, don't worry too much about the, the word flow here, but you could study this problem about like just trying with your hands to move the curve in such a way that the curve like moves in the direction of a vector perpendicular to it, right? So remember that um, if you have a, a, a curve, there are some vectors which are tangent to the curve and there, are other, there were uh, other vectors which are perpendicular to the curve, okay? So, oh, here it is. Oh, this is cool. Glad that the Apple cables can be useful for pedagogical purposes, right? Here's a curve. This would be like a, a vector. Remember a vector was just like an arrow. This is a vector that would be sort of tangent to the curve, okay? Meaning that it gives you like sort of the direction of the curve at that point. And then here is like a vector which would be perpendicular to the curve at that point, okay? So if you, uh, the, the idea is like, imagine drawing at each point of the curve, like this vector, which is perpendicular, right? And you sort of try to start pushing with your fingers the curve in this direction, okay? This is essentially what's happening here. For, so, uh, which is what is called a flow in mathematical terminology. So um, what I'm saying is that if you think about what's happening in this picture, as you start, deforming the curve in the direction determined by these perpendicular vectors, it sort of starts becoming more symmetrical and more circular, right? So in a sense, there's a way to get the circle, right? Uh, out, of, out of any random closed curve that you started with, just by uh, deforming the curve uh, using this strategy. Is, is this making sense? So what I'm saying is that all of these curves are all, all of these closed curve, no, no matter how crazy you try to draw them, right? This is fun. Like you should play with this sometime. No matter how crazy you try to draw them, there is sort of a way to make it, make them all like look more and more like the circle that you know and love, right? Another thing that was happening, uh, oh, this is cute piece of art. Another thing that was happening here is that, uh, so this is like, first, so first of all, this is why we say that there's like, a, when, if you were just to look at closed universes, which are one dimensional, meaning like closed curves, which are one, that, which are almost like one dimensional by definition, like cir the circle is really 
all that there is in our classification, just because there's like a way to make all the other curves to resemble more and more like a circle just by by uh, by doing this flow. Now, what just happened, if you just saw it, is that after a while, uh, when you start pushing this, you have to be careful because if you just like go crazy and keep pushing, 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 like uh, the, the circle will try to collapse to a point, right? Once you collapse to a point, you have destroyed your universe, right? And you are not uh, Thanos, so you don't want to destroy anything here, right? So uh, just don't go all the way, right? Uh, so, So what I'm trying to say is that uh, if you were to push uh, the, the, the curves in the directions of the normal vectors to the curves, if you so if if you deform. The curves, ooh, let's see in the direction determined by the normal vectors, there uh, they will uh, approach a circle more and more. And if you wait a sufficiently amount of time, like it will collapse to a point and eventually. The circle will collapse. Okay, but uh, since you can sort of make all the curves resemble more and more like a circle. This is why uh, you say that uh, like the circle is, uh, if you were to do this taxonomy of one dimensional worlds, uh, there, there's really only one thing to, work, uh, to understand, which is uh, the circle, because everything else can be made uh, as much as, uh, as close as you want to a circle by doing this flow. Now, if you were to do this with surfaces, Uh, there's like a similar type of pushing that you could do with the surface if you want. Now, uh, I, not that it matters too much, but it's also so that the picture is like, um, uh, the idea is more clear. Like uh, here, when I was drawing the, the curves, really like you can think of the pushing as happening on like, you know, you can think of the curve being drawn on the XY plane and there's sort of like the curve is being, being moved on the XY plane, right? There's like a more like um, abstract way to do this so that you don't have to think of the curve somehow as being uh, inside anything else. But I mean, it's not too important for, I, mean, I guess for surfaces and other things, you can do it more uh, abstractly so that you don't have to think of the surface being inside a bigger space. But that's not an issue if it makes your life uh, easier to conceptualize. So just imagine like draw your favorite surface in the world uh, again, let me go just to show you an animation. I mean, it's not an animation, but it's like a paper about this. Oh, yeah, someone was going to say something, or let's see. Um, I think this is this one. Yes, uh, ooh, let's go here. Well, let's ignore all these funny looking formulas. Oh, here you are. So like you could like here now draw like your favorite surface in the world. 
okay? And again, there's like a thing you could do, like some sort of pushing around that, um, that will like start making the surface more and more like uh, of, a, of a standard shape, okay? So like there's like a way to, uh, let's see if they had more, oh, here it looks cuter. Right, there's like a way to homogenize this, like make it more symmetric as time goes by. So let's just go back to, which is analogous to what we were doing right now. Uh, oh, it's like, oh, no, it didn't die, but it sort of died. So. It's download. It's opening again. It's taking forever. Oh, here you are. Sorry. Oh, someone asked something on the chat. Uh, yeah. It's uh. I guess you could uh. Right, you can think about it in that way if you want. There's also uh, there's a way to present it which is uh, closer to to how how it's done for the case of three dimensional universes. I mean, I, right? Like you could think about it like in this way of the of the normal vector. Uh, in the case of surfaces. Uh, and that's fine, but there's like a more interesting perspective in the case of surfaces, um, which is sort of just modifying, like you can sort of think that you're changing, like how you're defining the notion of distance at any, at any given moment of time. So you can imagine that there's like, uh, you know, like um, you, um, in the same way in which you can think of temperature as a function on the surface, right? there's like a way to think of distance as a function on the surface. And the idea is that you can make the distance change obeying some equation. And that's more or less how this deformation is happening. So if you wanted like a more intrinsic perspective, you can think of like, like some sort of like distance function in the sense of, in the same way in which there's some sort of temperature distribution on the surface, there could be like, oh no, uh, it's like, uh, that's a great question. It's more like, uh, so what I mean here by distance, uh, the fancy word for this is like metric, but like the idea is when you have like uh, a surface, Right, if you have a surf, oh, where did I do? Oh, here it is. If you have a surface, uh, you know, when you have, or let, let me start here. When you have a line, right, you have like a tangent line, right? Does that make sense? Like, it's like a line that barely touches the curve at a point, right? As you move the through along this curve, the, the 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 tangent line can change, right? When you have a, a, a surface instead of a line, right? Tangent line, it makes more sense to have a tangent plane, right? And that, as you can see it here, uh, is sort of changing as you move uh, the point on the surface, right? Now, the, like the idea is that uh, once you have a tangent plane, you know, a tangent plane is like a plane. So you can sort of define something that's called the dot product between two vectors on the plane. Okay. That product is just uh, it, it, it basically, I mean, not that it would tell you too much here in the, uh, this moment. Uh, but it's basically like the product of the sizes of the vector times the cosine of the angle between the vectors. Okay, if you have seen that before. But it, I'm just saying like, there's like a way to extract, uh, multiply these vectors together and you get a number that's called a dot product. And then uh, 
when when I was saying that you modify the distance, what I really meant is that you can imagine modifying the, this definition of multiplication according to some rule, and that uh, ends up having the effect of modifying how you measure distances because the like <laughs> this is going to get too crazy if I don't draw any pictures. So what's distance really? Uh, Imagine that uh, what is this creature? I don't know. Imagine that you're this creature traveling from this point to this point, right? How would you like, uh, how, how would be a way to think about the distance travel, right? Uh, well, if you were moving at a constant speed, right? Uh, then the, the distance would be just be the, you know, uh, the, 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 the time that it took you, right? Is that making sense? Now, what happens is that like, uh, the really the way to think about this is that, uh, this like, again, sorry. If, um, there's a difference between speed and velocity that sometimes in common language, right? In English or other languages, is not too emphasized. But the difference between speed versus velocity is that velocity is really, this is a vector in the sense that this has like uh, an arrow. So arrow meaning it points somewhere. So it points somewhere. So in the sense that this arrow, right? If this represented the velocity of a car, right? This would be a diff these two cars uh, would, would have different velocities. So these two are different velocities because they're pointing, one is pointing north and the other is pointing east, right? And yet uh, it could be the case that they have the same speed because the speed is just like sort of how big this vector is. Is that making sense? But could, the speed is just how big the, velocity vector is. Uh, strictly speaking, this is called the norm or size magnitude of the vector if you take linear algebra or calculus eventually. Or physics, I suppose this is also discussed in physics. Right, so two different vectors can have the same speed. Is that making sense? So two different uh, velocities, vectors, Is that okay? Is that sort of making sense uh, with everyone have the same speed if they have the same size, if the arrows have the same size? So what I'm trying to say is that like um, one way to think about the, imagine that like this had been like a point P where you started and at point Q where you end your trajectory, right? One way to think about, one way to compute the distance from P to Q along the curve, right? There's like a difference between the distance from P to Q that you learn in, you know, in high school geometry, which is the Pythagoras theorem. I don't know if everyone, I think we talked about those distances once, right? There's a distance between P to Q if you're allowed just to move freely on the plane, right? But there's like a distance from P to Q through the curve, right? Which means how much had you had to travel along the curve, right? So there's like a distance along the curve. Is that making sense?
is this okay? Is it making sense to everyone? So like uh, the, the distance between two curves, the, sorry, the distance between two points on the curve is sort of how much wire, right? How much wire is there between this point and that point, right? So what I'm saying is that uh, if you think about this formula, Uh, essentially, this is saying that like one way to think about how you would be able to compute the distances is by knowing like your speed, right? Like you can sort of recover uh, the distance from the speed, like in a sense, um, and the amount of travel. But like, I'm just saying like essentially, uh, really like the speed somehow becomes more important because that would eventually allow you to to find the the, the 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 distance between two points. So if you know this, uh, the uh, if you know the speed, you can sort of figure out the distance between two points. And so what I'm trying to say here is that uh, what you can imagine think of doing is that uh, when I said that you modify your definition of distance, basically what I meant is like what you're, you can think of doing is like modifying how you're computing the speed. So really uh, there's like a way to modify how you measure speed which affects how you measure distance. So like, this is like the idea of rich flow and other types of flows. Uh, so, but like the punchline or the key idea is that uh, by modifying your notion of speed or how speed is computed, you could uh, modify the, 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 the distance between the two points by changing your notion uh, of how to compute speed. Uh, you in, indirectly are changing how the distance between the two points is being computed. Okay, and so like the idea is that on these surfaces on the, on, on the images that I was showing you, Uh, basically, what you can think that was being done is that you were just like um, redefining, like uh, like you sort of apply like a process to these surfaces where you start redefining how you were computing the, the the speeds on each of these surfaces, and that sort of ends up affecting like the distance between the different like the points on the surface, and that's how they end up being deformed. Is that sort of making sense? That's like a difficult idea to convey, but you're sort of like rechanging your notion of speed, basically. And that's like the intrinsic way to to do this, like meaning that like you just talk about things about on the surface. This. Uh, Thing about speed and all of that is also related to general relativity, like uh, this dot product between the vectors on the tangent planes that I was telling you about, that has to do with something that's called the metric in general relativity and other things. But I'm just saying like, uh, basically the trick is to just change your mind about how you were computing the speeds. Uh, what's cool is that uh, you sort of, 
the way in which you change your mind about how your computing speeds uh, is more or less the same way in which uh, the, 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 the formula that like the, 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 the definition for how your the speed is being computed changes is more or less the same formula for how the temperature the, the, the temperature of ace when you try to understand how temperature changes over time so there's like a what i'm saying here is like uh you like you have like a rule like an equation which is called the like uh the ricci flow uh you have a, a rule that tells you okay i want the the, the the distance to be recomputed according to some rule to some equation and this equation that's being used for redefining how you compute the distance is more or less essentially the same equation that you use to understand how temperature changes over time. That's uh, so I should write this because that's like an important idea. So the way the the rule or equation that tells you um, how your definition of distance or, or your definition of speed or your way of computing speed changes over time is basically the same rule or it's basically the same equation that governs how temperature changes on a in a room or like uh, And that equation is called, I mean, in the case of temperature, this equation is called the heat equation. So here's like the analogy with thermodynamics that I was trying to mention last time, right? If you have like a, a room, if you have a room, let's use like a weather channel type uh, representation. You can imagine like the room being like very hot on one corner, right? So I'm going to use different colors of te for temperature. And then uh, maybe it, it gets colder away from this very hot spot. And then it looks more like this. So you could imagine like a temperature uh, distribution, right? meaning that the temperature did not start homogeneous on the room. This is where like some somewhere here, the max occurred, right? Like that maximum temperature occurred and somewhere in here, the minimum temperature occurred, right? And so what happens in like, what happens as you start waiting a sufficiently amount of time, right? What happens with the temperature? It becomes like if you don't introduce external factors, right? Like an AC or someone like just introducing heat or removing heat from the room, right? Sort of like the temperature will reach like a uniform distribution. It homogenizes, correct? And like, I don't know if you remember, like, but essentially like the temp like the final temperature or the limiting temperature will be somewhere in between the max maximum temperature and the minimum temperature, right? So let's try to find like a color for something in between. But you get like some sort of like uniform distribution, right? Of temperature. 
now the way of thinking of this homogenization, right, is that there's like a loss of information, right? Is, is this clear why this is happening? So here there's some loss of information. Why am I saying that there's like a loss of information? Because imagine that you had started with a different setup, which is exactly the same room, right? But now the temperature, the distribution, like it's, it has the same profile, but it's just that the, you change your mind of where the hottest spot happened. So maybe now the hottest spot is here. I'm sorry, this should have been like a different color. I think this one. Like the hottest corner was here. And then you had um, this one. So imagine it's almost like exact, exactly the same room, but you sort of turn it upside down, right? Or like just flip it. Like the temperature function is different, right? Because like it has different values of temperature at different locations, right? But uh, right, 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 right. Like the curvature is sort of telling you correct, like how the scaling is, yes, good, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly the the curvature that, that you're like you are giving a recipe where the curvature is sort of controlling uh, how you're changing the you're, redefi you're re redefining the the speed or the distance. Yeah. Uh, what I'm trying to say here now is that um, if you started with a different like again like with the same room and even the same values for the temperature but the the location where the max and the mean hap, hap, happens are just on different spots right still the the same uniform distribution is rich right so meaning that the uniform this uniform distribution can be the limit right of many different initial states is that making sense so so the uniform distribution can be reached from many different initial configurations, right? Is that making sense? Uh, and so uh, this is, if you think about it, this is why this is like a, a good analogy with what ha was happening in this animation I show you about the curves, right? Because somehow in the case of the curves, something similar was going on where, where we started with different closed curves, right? So we started with different initial states, correct? But the final states were sort of the same, right? Uh, if you let the, the curve change over time according to our rule, right? The final state, I mean, depending on where you want to end things, you would say it's like a circle or just a point if you just want to wait enough so that everything collapses. But in a sense, you can think of the final, like the final state as being like uh, this circle, right? Where everything try is trying to converge. So this is why you should think that uh, like what's happening is some, somehow analogous to a thermodynamical process where like you could start with very, uh, qualitatively different spaces, right? But you're sort of forcing them to change in such a way that their differences are being lost, right? Uh, you're a person who don't like, does not like different opinions. <laughs> so you eliminate everyone, every difference in the world. That's probably not a nice world to live in, but at least for other studied spaces, that's sort of useful. So, uh, 
this is like uh, there's like some thermodynamical analogy here. It, it, is that making sense? Now, what I'm saying is that in the case of surfaces, it's a little bit more complicated because now you could have obviously again initial states of surfaces, right? Just imagine drawing crazy surfaces, right? Like just draw your favorite surface, crazy surfaces in the world. Oh, this is not too crazy, but how about something like this? So here again, like there are different initial states, right? But now it's not that the final state is necessarily the same. Right now, the final state is actually controlled for by more data, which was this number of holes of the surface. So there was like this invariant or like a uh, key defining property, almost like DNA, where you know this is like the difference between phenotype and genotype. Is that how it's called? Uh, right, like phenotype is like the external manifestations of your DNA. Uh, but you could imagine someone having like exactly the same coding. Of like the same particular gene, but like it's just like external manifestations are different. So like almost the number of holes of a surface is like a DNA. It's more like intrinsic. It cannot really be changed. But you could imagine like different manifestations for 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 the number of holes. So like here, like if you run the same logic, if you run the same rules, like thermodynamical process, almost like a thermodynamical process to the surface. This one wants to get like more like a sphere because it had no holes. And this one also wants to become more like a sphere because it had no holes, okay? But this one actually has one, two, three holes. So it will not go to a sphere. It will go to something more intricate, which was like this pretzel with three holes or whatever. Uh, I don't remember which was, like, I mean, we can draw it this way just to make it like, just to make it like some standard convention. But what I'm saying is that here now that final state does depend on some more uh, topological properties, what's, that's the word, which is called the number of holes, so. Is that making sense? And so uh, the, there's something similar that happens in the case of three-dimensional universes, which is what we were ultimately interested in, which is like the proof of Perman, uh, why he got this Millennium Prize, which he re had rejected. But uh, like the point is that, uh, but the, like philosophically sort of the same strategy. So, uh, if you have like a three dimensional universe, which again, like I don't, I cannot really draw too well. This is not like a 3D stuff, right? Like, but if you had like a three dimensional universe, the idea is like uh, there was like a conjecture by Thurston who had proven like certain cases uh, called the geometrization conjecture. So there was a conjecture by Thurston. Uh, who was a ma mathematician who had given like uh, a sense like of a classification of all the final states that could occur. Like, like what I'm trying to say is like, uh, uh, oh, like infinite dimensional, like, um, oh, you mean like uh, of infinite size, like not a uh, finite size, not like finite volume. Is that, is that uh, what you mean? Like, uh, like say, uh, uh, 
Oh, oh, okay. You mean like actual number of dimensions, like three, four, five, six? Yeah. Oh, good, good, good. I mean, uh, great question. I mean, there's like, uh, it's not as useful. I mean, you can sort of write it in any dimension. It's just not as useful as in dimension three or two. Um, the thing is like what happens really is that like there's a I mean there's like a lot of going on here, but like there's like a thing called the Riemann tensor or the Riemann curvature tensor that really encodes all the information you wanted to ask about distances and other such things, angles and other things. That has like, that's the matrix in the sense of, I mean, the literal sense actually, not just like the computer crazy matrix that controls like humans in the movie, but also matrix in the sense that it can actually be represented by some sort of matrix type creature. If you have seen matrices before. Uh, in dimension three, the thing is like this Riemann tensor has the same, it's completely control, uh, it's essentially carries the same information as what's called the Ritchie tensor, which is the one that's being used in these Ritchie flows. So it's just that uh, in higher dimensions, like uh, the Ritchie flow is less powerful just because it does not have the same sort of amount of, informa of information. So um, a lot of people have tried to use it for dimension four, I think, but it's not, I don't think you can like, uh, it seems like you cannot get as much, as many interesting things as you can in dimensions three, uh, because it just carries less information about the space or manifold, which is a name for the one. Oh yeah, yeah, there are flows for higher dimensions. Correct, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the full disclosure is what I might be called, and what like, some people call a low dimensional topologist meaning that low dimensional topologies is someone who only cares about dimensions two, three, and four. <laughs> so I'm not the right person to ask about. Uh, I mean, I know that there are things like in higher dimensions. I just don't know how useful they are and for what purposes they had been used. But yeah, 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 you can write, uh, you can write things in higher dimensions. There are many reasons why you can argue that dimension four is the most special of all dimensions. Besides the fact that we expect the space time to be four dimensional, I mean, you could believe other people who say that it's higher dimensional, but I mean, there are mathematical reasons for why dimension four is like the most important number. Uh, it doesn't, it's not like a roller coaster, right? Like you might, I don't think, I think I gave you this analogy one day. You might imagine that as the number of dimensions grows, that the problem just become, keep becoming more and more complicated, right? But in, re in, in reality, it's more like a roller coaster where the peak reaches dimension four. So dimension four is where almost uh, most almost nothing is no where less is known, like and somehow in less than four dimensions or more than four dimensions, the problems are just easier to understand. Uh, so it's not that dimension twenty thousand is harder than dimension ten thousand which is harder than dimension four. Like dimension four is harder than everything else and that's the end period. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, no, like there are many ways in which you can generalize these ideas, correct? Yeah, yeah, there are many flow, like there's, there's a cool topic. Yeah, but there are many generalized. Math mathematicians are creatures who like to generalize sometimes almost as an addiction. So almost anything that you ask me, I'll tell you that there, it has been misgeneralized, but I don't know uh, to what extent it has been worked out yet. So, but what I was saying is that if you start with a 3D universe, uh, again, you could start with a random initial state and then you apply this sort of, again, you apply this equation that tells you how you are changing your notions of speed or whatever. Oh. Well, in fact, like uh, there's like there's like a sense in which like you never need uh, 
like the the modern point of view is that you never need to think of your universe as being inside of a bigger universe like you mean like there's like a way to study like as there's like a way to study a sphere right with the surface of the sphere there's like a perspective to study the surface of a sphere without thinking that the surface of the sphere is really in this three-dimensional space that i'm drawing right this perspective can be applied to any dimension so that's not really uh now it's true that like for practical purposes or visualization skills it's somehow useful that certain things can be visualized as being inside of other bigger things right like for example in the case of the surfaces but uh it's not that uh it, it, um, dimension four is special for other reasons uh, which are harder to state but like for example uh, there's like a sense in which in dimension four is the only dimension in which you can do different versions of calculus uh, there are ways to define calculus which are not standard and that can only happen in dimension four like that's one thing that's uh, interesting to realize but that's hard to like that that's really not something that i would even try to do in a seminar like this like i don't know how successful the seminar was but definitely i would tell you that that particular thing about how to define different versions of calculus in dimension four that's something definitely one cannot try to explain in this seminar or any other and that's like a very complicated thing but it's more like there's like some special features that you can only do in dimension four. They just cannot be done anywhere else. So yeah, yeah, that's good, good. This is food for thought, right? Like just, but I'm just dropping a bunch of things and maybe if you grow old, you may revisit them in your other moments in your life. Uh, but yeah, I can give you some references if you want. But, I, but I'm afraid there's not like a great reference that it would explain. Like I would need to think hard if there's a place where one could find like a friendly explanation of what's going on. Uh, but anyhow, the idea was like, if you start with a three dimensional universe, again, there could be different initial states. And I, like already for the case of surfaces, there were like different final states right but at least here like the final states like more or less are characterized by the number of holes in dimension three is more complicated just like that something like the number of holes so in a sense like thurston who, who was another mathematician had given like a list of like a description somehow of all the final states that the these three-dimensional universe, universes could have so Uh, it's just that, like, uh, right, I suppose it does not make a lot of sense to go into all the different possibilities because it's more, it's a little bit harder to just go over those, those cases. But like, the, like, what you should take away from this is that it's sort of like the same type of, like, it has been like this problem of uh, what Perriman did was sort of showed that, like, indeed, this conjecture was true in the sense that all these, these were like all the final states that were possible. Um, but like what you should take, a, a, the takeaway is that you should like, that this was studied by using like a process that was similar to like a heat equation or like an equation that temperature satisfies. So there was some sort of like thermodynamical analog that, it, like, that was studied here. And the difference is that you have to like, in dimension three, there are a lot more things that can go wrong. So you have to, you have to say, uh, like you have to be more careful about, about understanding 
what's everything that, that can happen. Okay. Um, just to, um, and that's more or less like, uh, like once you have this taxonomy, then like the Poincaré conjecture, which was actually the topic of this uh, course, like almost follows uh, more easily from this bigger result. So what I'm trying to say is that Perman, instead of showing directly the Poincaré conjecture, she showed a bigger result telling you what all the final states of the universes are. And from there, like the actual Poincaré conjecture was uh, solved as a special case of this bigger conjecture. Okay, so like the Poincaré conjecture. So Perriman proved this conjecture. So uh, right, maybe yes. Just to like um, finish this up. I mean, this is more or less like everything that I wanted to say. Like maybe just so because we have a couple of minutes left, I should at least mention like again, like this analogy of this being similar to like some sort of heat equation is more more um more literal than it may seem at first uh because in thermodynamics there's also like a quantity known as entropy right i don't know if anyone knows what entropy is Oh, and what did they tell you? What did what, what did the chemists tell you? <laughs> yes, it's like an amount of disorder. or this information or information, depending on how you prefer to think of it. Uh, yes, correct. Now that's the thing, right? So there's this second law of thermodynamics, right? Uh, which uh, I don't know if anyone remembers what it says, it states, but it states like essentially in an isolated system, right? A, a system without external influences, like entropy just increases over time, right? Uh, When taken to the universe, it's as a as a on its own. Like if you look at the entire universe, right? If you think of the universe as an isolated system, just because by definition, like you like the universe, if you think of it as everything that exists, then there could not be external influences, right? And so, like once entropy was found and the second law was found in the Victorian age, which was around the time it was found, right? Like during the Industrial Revolution, because this sort of fit or 
uh, helped the pessimistic mood of the era. And so people talked about the heat death of the universe. I don't know if you have heard that, that phrase. Well, you should Google it, Google it. But uh, the heat death of the universe would, would be like a state if, where if you waited in a long enough time, then like, like the universe has reached a thermal equilibrium state. Like the thing is like, if you think about it, like um, work can happen because there are differences in temperature. That's more or less like, what, like what's going on. So once you reach thermal equilibrium, there's no possibility for uh, anything, any interesting process to take place. So, and like, in a sense, like the, ent like the entropy will be, um, yeah, the big freeze is actually a different one, but yeah, that's one, another one is also fun. Uh, but yeah, the heat death is one where um, entropy would reach, like once you, the like universe, it's on its own, you know, like right now the universe is not in thermal equilibrium, right? Uh, there are many dynamical processes still happening. But if you imagine like, oh, well, what if you wait sufficiently lo long time and all these stars end up uh, exploding, right? Like, you know, they, it starts to like, grow to a certain size before they explode. And like everything just like gets, like becomes completely uniformized in some sort of soup, universal soup of like particles where there's no temperature differences, then everything sort of would reach like a static distribution which is similar to what's happening here with the temperature right like uh what's cool here is like if you have temperature differences like like there's like heat transfer and then like you know uh, the air may change from one location to the other you get air currents or something else like that but here once you reach the uniform distribution everything is the same so like in a sense this uniform this universe is more boring than this one where entropy has not been reaches maximal state. So people took this the wrong way. I mean, I guess some become became pessimistic, despite the fact that this would happen like in billions of billions of billions of billions of billions of years, right? That's something that you have to worry about. Um, uh, and so, um, but yeah, so the entropy, according to the second law, the entropy is supposed to increase over time. Uh, this is sort of like the thermodynamical description of entropy. As someone mentioned on the chat, then physicists like Boltzmann and others came with a, a statistical interpretation of entropy. I hope I'm writing Boltzmann properly. I think that's the right name, uh, the right spelling, if I'm not mistaken. Great character, a very interesting person. Uh, a sad life, but very interesting. Um, what Boltzmann said is that, well, you should actually, there's also another issue, which again, again, I'm just, this is the last day, I'm just throwing you words so that you also Google some things. There's also something called the arrow of time. I don't know if someone has heard about this one. Uh, right, like the problem is that uh, if you look at all the basic laws of nature, I mean, that's more or less true. I mean, at least that was essentially true at the time of a statistic like 19th century physics. If you look at all the laws of nature at uh, the fundamental laws of nature, they sort of do not seem to distinguish past from future. There's a mathematical, more precise way to say this. The thermo, but ironically, the second law does seem to give you some directionality in time because it says that the entropy is supposed to increase. That obviously is introducing some asymmetry. Physicists have this issue about how to explain the second law if all the laws, all the basic laws in nature seem to be 
immune to to differentiating between past and future. And then Boltzmann came up with a statistical interpretation of entropy, wherein his approach is not that entropy is always increasing over time. Uh, well, it is still like an open issue, but it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, I mean, no, it is still like, I mean, people still debate the arrow of time. It's just that it's, it, it is now more complicated than just saying that the arrow, like the, that the laws of nature are, uh, I mean, now there are laws, that, I mean, there's, there's some certain processes that do, it has to do with quantum mechanics. Yeah, there are certain processes in quantum mechanics that do violate, that do have like time directionality. So people now talk, now talk about what's called CPT, which is charge parity time reversal. So uh, it's like a longer story, but I'm just saying like, yeah, for the overwhelming, it's a little bit more complicated, but in any case, like the, the idea is that Boltzmann tried, uh, if you look at the end of 19th century physics, beginning of the 20th century physics, there was this question about why, uh, why would you have like something like the second law that says that things have to increase over time, like entropy, if uh, all the laws, basic not laws of nature, given by Newton and Maxwell seem to suggest that that was not the case, that like there was no difference between past and future. And uh, so Boltzmann came up with an interpretation of entropy in terms of statistical mechanics or statistical physics, where basically the idea, uh, I mean, in his interpretation, it's not that entropy always increases over time. It's just that entropy the over, had the overwhelming majority of time, it will increase over time. But like there can be uh, from, time to time, the entropy could decrease. Like, it's like a little bit more complicated, but it's just like a pro, it's not that there's like, the second law is like a, a complete certainty that it always increases. It's just that with high probability, it, it, it ends up increasing, which does make a little bit of a difference, like uh, in uh, philosophically. And so what he realized is like, for example, imagine that you had like two carbon particles, right? Uh, or two uh, oxygen, like say hydrogen atoms, right? Right. Imagine that you have two hydrogen atoms, right? I'm going to call these two atoms H1 and H2, H1 and H2, just because I think of them as being different atoms, right? Even though their chemical properties would be the same as hydrogen atoms, right? So like, in a sense, what Boltzmann said was like, well, if you think about it, right, these two, what, how do they differ? These two configurations differ from one another, right? Like they differ in the sense that this hydrogen atom one is to the left to, of hydrogen two in this picture, but and in this other one, it has been flipped, right? So the microstates are different, right? Like in Boltzmann's terminology, these are two different microstates, right? But it would give rise to the same macro state because like in terms of the physical characteristics of the system, there would be no phys physical difference whatsoever, right? Because like both hydrogen atoms have the same, the same, uh, the same properties. Is, is that sort of making some sense? So. These are two different microstates. But it's the same microstate. Is that is that okay? Because like uh holistically, then the, the, these two would behave the same way, right? Like their 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 properties like of the system as a whole is the same. Despite the fact that the individual Yes, yes. And uh, and then what he realized is that you could redefine entropy. Like the point of Boltzmann is that like somehow if you had a, a configuration if you had a configuration where like say all the particles are in one corner of a box, right? Now imagine you have like 10 to the 23 molecules, right? Imagine that you had like a uh, uh, all the particles sort of in one corner of the box versus like all the particles spread out.
th uniformly throughout the box. Well, what Boltzmann realized is that somehow, like there are overwhelming, there are a lot more microstates associated to this configuration than microstates associated to this configuration. And so the reason, in a sense, why entropy, like if if you associate entropy with the sort of like the number of microstates of a given macrostate, then this is why um, somehow um, this ent this system will have higher entropy than this one. Like really, the entropy has to do with the logarithm of the number of micro microstates. But like essentially, what Boltzmann noticed is that uh, the the cases where like things happen to be uniform, in a sense, is where um, where the, the, the there's the most number of microstates compatible with with the system, so like like the definition of entropy. Just to make it concrete, uh, if you had a, a coin, so imagine that you you had a coin. Like this is a cute example, uh, heads or tails, right? So they're like uh, in in the case of a. a a coin, like you could like, uh, you only have two possibilities, two outcomes, right? For for what the value of a coin can be. Uh, so imagine like uh, you just like have like a bunch of coins, right? You have a box with co coins. And you just start picking uh, coins from that from this box, right? And you just look at the coin from one side, and you just record what you saw, right? So maybe when you pick a coin, you see heads, 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 and then you see a tail, and then you see a tail, and you see a tail, right? Then you see a tail, right? And uh, so there's like a probability that you'll like there will be a certain probability that you'll see a tail, and there will be a certain probability that you'll see heads. So you could say PT, which is the probability of looking at tails, of getting a tail. And pH, which is the probability of getting a cat. And well, when here, when you say probability, you mean like as a number between zero and one, right? Like instead of saying like 50% probability, you would say 0 0.5, right? So like meaning as, uh, as numbers from zero to one. So what would like what would be this first fact about probabilities? Like what can you say about like the sum of the probabilities? What should this always be? Anyone can tell me if you have taken a statistics. It should be one because you should always see something, right? So you always see something, right? Now, if you thought of this process as happening completely in a random way. Right, if this were completely done randomly, right, what would you expect the probabilities to be like? Right, right, you would expect that everything just sort of like it was fair, right? Like this is sort of also related to our notion of fairness, like, right, if somehow you did, if you were drawing them. Uh, without cheating or like maybe the pro coins were built in such a way that cat feels different than the coin side and maybe you can distinguish that with your fingers and then you can cheat the game the system right but if somehow you were always able to draw cat after cat after cat after cat after cat or tail after tail after tail after tail you would find think oh my god there's something suspicious right like this this would be suspicious in the lottery system right if you if you always get, got the same number like numbers for the the powerball i don't remember the name for all those hundreds of millions of dollars you could get so you would expect that in the completely random case right
And there's like a definition of entropy given more or less by Boltzmann, although uh, this was later in this, in the way in which I'm telling you this formula. It, this was given by Shannon. And this is actually the type of definition that's used in electronics or communication, like messaging, cell phone companies and other things, computer science. But you can associate like an entropy to this experiment Uh, sometimes this is called, also called S, I suppose. But, and the entropy of this experiment is minus PT, the natural log. I mean, up to a constant, actually. You can measure it in natural log of two so that it think, you think of this as bits, but it doesn't matter. That doesn't matter too much. Sorry. So the entropy of this system is just, uh, you take the natural log of the probabilities and you multiply it by this corresponding probability. And you just, I mean, let's write it this way. You take the natural log of the, of Oh, where am I? I'm about to finish. Sorry, I just said like this doesn't take too much longer. Uh, you take the natural log of each probability and multiply it by the corresponding probability value, and then you just add up the result and minus that number is the entropy. So, uh, for example, if if it's both uh, PT pH equals one half, then what's the entropy for this value? It would be minus one half ln of one half plus one half ln of one half, okay? But if, if PT equals one quarter and pH equals three quarters, right? Because remember the probabilities have, have to add up to one, then it gives you one quarter ln of one quarter plus three quarters ln of three quarters, okay? Is that clear how you're computing these entropies? Uh, Now, because PT plus PH is always one, you can sort of, if you think about this as calculus problem, you can say you can get rid of one of the probabilities. And so you can really think of H as a function of just one of these variables. Let's call it PT. And so it's really minus LN uh, minus PT LN of PT plus one minus PT ln of one minus pt. And so here's a calculus problem for you. If you call x the probability of tails, you have this function, which is minus x ln of x plus one minus x ln of one minus x. And you think of this as a calculus problem, OK? And you find where the max of this function is. This is where you, what, why you need the minus sign. And, and if you have done this, you would set the first derivative equal to zero. And you, you check that this gives you a max with the second derivative test, for example. But you'll find that the, the max occurs when x equals 1 half. Meaning that the pro, the, this function is uh, maximized. So entropy or this function is maximized when the probabilities are the same. And the idea is like that's when the message or the, the experiment is the most random because then you cannot really predict it's, it, that's where it's harder to predict the outcome, right? If it's all 50-50, you're not really sure what you're going to get. If you somehow, the probabilities were like a quarter and three quarters, you have a better sense of when to predict, the, of how to predict things, right? The extreme case is where one probability is one and the other is zero, and then you can always predict the outcome, right? So as en entropy increases, 
sort of the probabilities become more homogeneous. And so the events homogenize again. And the idea is that there's like a similar notion of entropy that you can define for this question about the curves evolving over time or the universe is evolving over time. And that does play a similar role to entropy in thermodynamics in the sense that it always increases over time. Okay, but well, this I thought was a good way to end because I like entropy and the rural arrow of time. But yeah, I think this, well, I had fun. Uh, hope the rest of the semester goes well also. And um, yeah, I don't think I have much more to say. <laughs> if something comes up, feel free to email. Right. Yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad you liked it. Good, good. Good luck, yeah. I'm going to start teaching a class soon, so I'll just get ready for that. But yeah, feel free to email me if something if you want more references or just have any random questions. But yeah, good, good. I'll see you all someday. <laughs>